Welcome viewers to our favorite program, Eyewitness. As you know, this is a program where each week we have a conversation with a Nigerian who has devoted his or her life in pursuit of the public good, of the collective, for the community, and for the good of the nation. In other words, we are taking a narrative that is very different from the normal narrative about the Nigerian elite, about self-service, about self-aggrandizement, about corruption. I think it's important, and we show that every week in this program, that the other side of the Nigerian reality should come up for discussion and to inform us that not everybody in this country is the same. Today, we have a very interesting uh, topic, which is intergenerational fractures that affect our country our society, our community. And we have with us today someone who has had a long experience as a public servant, as an election administrator, as an academic, and now as a civil society activist. He may even be a politician. I'm not so sure about uh, that. His name is Hakim Baba Ahmed. Yeah, welcome to the program, Hakim. Thank you very much, Jewel, and thank you for inviting me. A pleasure. Yeah, a difficult one to interview because we are the same background, very similar background, classmates, et cetera, et cetera. But let's not divert. <laughs> into that. Uh, I think the question of intergenerational fracture is something that's very important to understand in our society today. Before discussing it, however, we want to get to know you a bit. What's your background? Where were you born? Where did you do primary school? Do you have a primary school certificate? <laughs> Yes, well, thank you. once again, thank you very much for inviting me, and, uh, and thank you for this program. I watch it all the time. I, I genuinely believe that it's contributing by bringing in new dimensions uh, to uh, an elite that I think, uh, Nigerian elite that has suffered uh, a lot. Uh, and as you said, it's, it's important to remind Nigerians that um, we are not all bad. We may all be in the gutter, as someone said, but some of us are looking up at the stars. Um, I was born in Zaria in 1955. Uh, I went to primary school in Zaria, secondary school in Zaria. As you know, I went to university in Zaria as well. So <coughs> until I finished school, I was entirely a Zaria person. Um, uh, after I finished uh, school, um, uh, finished ABU with you. We read the same course with you, uh, graduated the same year. I, I was sent to Sokoto, the old Sokoto, for national service. While I was there, they had uh, opened the Usman, then the University of Sokoto. I was employed by that university. Uh, and immediately I finished my national service. While I was doing the service, I had secured admission outside the country, London School of Economics, to read for a master's program. I left immediately. They had an excellent tra staff training program which allowed you to go. There was enough money at that time for new universities to train their own staff. So I did my master's at the LSE, um, 78 and 79. I came back, taught for two years, um, and, uh, and went back again to the UK. I went to University of Sussex, and did my PhD, came back 85, <coughs> and uh, the rest there was we just work. The studies were over. Uh, you've introduced me. I've been a public servant. Yeah. But tell us about 
the community you grew up in, Tudungwada. How was Tudungwada in the 50s and 60s? What strikes you about a young boy growing up in Tudungwada? Um, even at that age, you knew it was different from other parts of the area. It was cosmopolitan. Uh, we didn't know the word then, but as we grew up, we understood what it meant. It meant that it's a part of the area uh, like other parts of the Hausa land, where people from all sorts of all parts of Nigeria and Africa um, came to settle because strangers or new people uh, or non-indigenous didn't settle in the main cities like Kanu and Kasina and Zaria. It was the same way. It was so thoroughly cosmopolitan that I can remember that most of my, many of my friends were Igbo and Yoruba. We grew up together. We used to play together, go into each other's houses, eat each other's food. Um, and there was, uh, there was very little <coughs> uh, distinction between who we were and what we did. Uh, that bond of all the communities living by the same rule, um, next house to each other. There were Muslims and Christians. And uh, uh, I'm afraid there were also a lot of um, uh, people who, who would offend today's uh, um, value systems uh, in Tudumwada. Um, houses that had entirely prostitutes, large numbers of houses of prostitutes. So our parents tended to sort of shield us from street influence. Uh, and we stayed more substantially indoors. But we would stay indoors in either a friend's house, uh, Ibo, or Yoruba, or in our house. Uh, and it was a very happy thing. Zaria was extremely, um, was heavily intellectualized. If you remember, it had uh, the Congo the population, the Barewa College influence, the Gaskia influence, the College of Nigeria Aviation College. So Zaria was the intellectual famine, was the intellectual focus for a long time, 40s and 50s and 60s and about 70s. So virtually everybody who had become an elite in the North went through one form of school or the other in Zaria. So we grew up. Uh, with our father in a cycle of uh, a lot of intellectuals. You, you could tell from their discussions. And it was a very happy agreement, I mean, very happy period in our lives, which was punctured by what happened in 1966, um, the killings. Some mm. of them were our friends, children. Um, but we saw the dead bodies, some of the, the dead bodies of our friends on the streets. Um, and for the first time, we experienced fear, and we saw, we saw uh, the negative side of humanity, uh, anger, callousness, um, and a lot of bitterness. And I, I, it took me years to recover from the experience of those in May 1966 and November 1966. Those killings have remained etched in my mind. And to date, I tell people, those experiences. Uh, I was, what, 11, 12 years old? But we knew, we saw people being killed. We saw dead bodies. And um, I went to primary school in Kofandoka, and uh, we used to walk through the hospital to do what I'm now I'm at the Bella University teaching hospital. And we used to literally walk over dead bodies for days before they were buried. And so you can imagine the trauma for a very young person. They, they had so many, they, in the end, they just dug up the ground and, and put them in. So it was a happy childhood, but I was um, raptured by, by that, that mm -hmm. experience. And it has remained part of me, and I, it will remain part of me until I die. Indeed, uh, the same with me. I grew up in Sabangari Kano, and we saw exactly the same thing. Let's move to your secondary school. I believe your biggest regret in life is that you didn't go to Barewa College. <laughs> you went to government secondary school, Zaria. How do you feel after all these years <laughs> that you never made it to the good school? 
I, I, knew, I knew you would come up to this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, let me just tell an interesting story. Our father, our father was recruited <coughs> by the Northern Indians in the 40s. Our father was Arab. When he came to Nigeria in 1920, he made Zaria his home. And the community accepted him. Um, very welcoming. In, well, there was initial resum, resum, um, reservation about whether he would stay. They wouldn't give him wives to marry. But after a while, they realized that he was going to stay there. So he stayed there. He was a merchant. And um, he did pretty well for himself. And after, two, I think, two or three years, they realized that he was serious about living in Zaria. So they relaxed with him. By the, mid, by the early 30s, it was very clear to the colonial authorities that Indians and chiefs and the prominent northern elite were reluctant to send their children to Western schools. They would send children of slaves or former slaves or uh, common people, give them their names, rather than send their own children, who would become emirs uh, later. And uh, they understood what the problem was there was still a very strong resistance to Western education and the fear that Western education would influence uh, the royalty, northern royalty, the establishment. And uh, some of them would be converted. And there was, Zaria had a very good example in, uh, in a missionary who came to Zaria and stayed in Milas, you know, stayed in Zaria for a while, started converting uh, uh, people in large numbers, including members of the Zaria royalty. And so there was some this panic and the the deal between the British colonialists and the emirs in the north is um, we will govern through you, we will protect your religion, we will uh, protect your throne as much as it is practicable for the purposes of control. In return you give us all the support and cooperation as a subordinate layer of authority. So Zaria was in the front line of this. And uh, so they decided that the British then approached the emirs and said, look, we know, we know that you are not sending your own children. These are the people who are likely to become emirs. It's not in your own interest, because the future belongs to those who can go to the Western schools. If we have an agreement that allows you to go to these schools, to send your own children to these schools, uh, what, would they, what would it be? What would you like to see? And the Amir said, if our children are going to go to the Western schools, they have to be allowed no conversion. Nobody should convert. Um, and we want someone or some people who would make, keep an eye on their respect and observance of Islamic uh, traditions. They must pray five times a day. There must be discipline that is consistent with Islamic traditions, those kind of things. By that time, as you know very well, because you are a Barewa person, you guys had migrated from Katina. You were coming down to Nigeria. You came to Kaduna uh, as refugees. You stayed for Kaduna. Barewa College stayed in Kaduna for a while. And then eventually found home in Zaria. So the Emirs uh, then decided <coughs> to delegate the Emir, uh, at that time, I think it was uh, uh, Suleiman. I think it was Emir Suleiman. They delegated him, that was before Jafar, to find someone who would provide, who would become the Imam of the college, um, and who would assume responsibility for tutoring and mentoring all the Muslim kids that would come there. And uh, so they was, went through this elaborate process of trying to find someone who was a good Muslim, good Imam, who would mentor children, Muslim children, who would be a guardian in spite of the existence of a very rigid and strict hierarchy in the school. Eventually, it turned out to be our father. So he went to Barewa College as an Imam. And all the students, I think from about 1943 until he left in 1962, who knew him. And they called him Lima. We were all born in Barrio College. And uh, our father decided that he didn't want anybody to go to Barrio College from his household. He didn't want to be both the head of the discipline in the school and, uh, and, and also um, have his own child there. 
And our eldest brother went there. And he was the last one to go. And he, the, my father had a lot of problem discipline with him. And, and that, he drew a line from there. No matter what you do, how well you do in common, you would not go to Barrio College. And none of us, not one of us, went to Barrio College. But we lived in Barrio College. Um, we, we, um, we knew so much about Barrio College. We, like I said, we were born there. We, it used to be called Collegia at the time. So our father left there in 1963, long before he went there. Uh, and uh, so Barrio is, is in our DNA. So I didn't go to the college, but we have, uh, we have a very strong bond with, with the college. But I went to a school that you guys still argue about was, uh, was better than Barrio College. <laughs> Government Secondary School. And uh, that rivalry is still there. It's, mm. uh, it's, it was healthy. It was good. Um, but I will, I will not argue with you. If this, this is your program. Yeah. So if you say Barrio, Barrio was the life, I, I will not argue with you. In this program, the guest has the last word. You so. take it. <laughs> <laughs> so Barewa DNA is in you, and that settles it. Now let's come to our theme, which is intergenerational fractures. Maybe the first question is, how would you describe that? What's that about? I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's about um, how societies, um, it's, the, the fractures refer to the failure of society to sustain the survival, the growth, survival, and development of basic values uh, and institutions that sustain and define society, both horizontally and vertically. And I'll explain this. Um, a society uh, is defined by uh, not just the collection of people, but sharing certain things, certain values in common. Um, and, and agreeing on, on some basics, who we are, what we are about, how we would rule ourselves, how we we'll govern ourselves. Um, and all nations do that. Um, and then you have the vertical uh, integration, which refers to um, uh, various segments of that same society having some common linkage, uh, common enough to keep them together uh, but still allowing and recognizing that there are differences. Fractures exist when uh, these systems that feed growth and development and sustenance begin to show breaks, uh, uh, either as a result of instability or periods of intense change uh, or conflicts that separate demographic demographic and, and, uh, and other groups from each other. Value systems break down. Um, the transmission of what is basic, the ideals, the value systems break down. Uh, and uh, on, on a horizontal basis, you have a uh, um, situation where critical groups become to distance themselves from each other, as a, either as a result, again, of sustained periods of instability or um, uh, conflicts uh, that do not allow uh, um, a healing process and reintegration. So, uh, but the most pronounced is generational. People born at a certain period share less and less in common with people born uh, 20, 30 years older than they are communication breaks down, the transmission of key values breaks down, um, linkages that are critical through institutions, through structures, through processes, through systems break down. And uh, so you have fractures because there is nothing, no rupture, no, nothing in place to heal the rupture. And Nigeria is a, it's a very good case study in countries that suffer serious and almost near endemic uh, generational fracture. We have lost control. We, you and I, our generation, uh, is barely in touch with the generation Nigerians who were born in, from the 80s or eight, nine, 80s. Nine, let's say nine, 1990. 
1990 to now is that 32 years. Mm -hmm. 1980 to now is 42 years. Most Nigerians who were born, 70% of Nigerians born today, don't know anything about what happened in 1966. They don't know anything about the Civil War. They read bits and pieces of it. Nobody teaches them history. Even if it is history that has two or three different versions of the same thing. Nobody teaches them history. Nobody, nobody has the same, there is no body of, no set of values that is shared across the country. There is no elite. There is no Nigerian elite anymore. There are elites of various factions, bits and pieces of the country. I belong to one of them, <laughs> Northern Elders Forum. We have similar ones, Mohaneze Indigo, Afeni Ferry. So you have uh, um, a drift. We've drifted apart as a country. Our values have crashed. Uh, there is nothing holding these generations together. Uh, and each generation, therefore, creates and lives within its own value system. Uh, and it's very difficult to for one generation to influence another generation. Um, and, and so growth and development are stunted, particularly the growth and development of values, which, in fact, which is central to the growth and development of the economic structures. Even a rich country that doesn't have shared values will crash in no time at all. There's got to be somebody who is the custodian of what is right, what is wrong, how to do things right, how to do them wrong. If that layer is not there, you have a very serious problem. You cannot even grow and develop. And I think that the whole of Africa is suffering from this. Um, part of it is rapid growth of the population. Part of it is just sustained instability and underdevelopment. Some of it is just rapid growth. A rabid uh, corruption that erodes virtually every value system. Uh, but when you have a combination of all these three, as we do in Nigeria, you have a very serious problem. So that's what we're talking about about regeneration and practice. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, perspective. Let's take one element, that of age. The median age of Nigerians is 18. But when you look at the political class, people my age and your age will be considered the young ones. So we have a political class of essentially people in their 70s and above. And given what you have described, how can they communicate when there's such a gap between them? They don't communicate. That's the simple truth. There's mm. no communication. During politics, politicians come out um, and because they cannot, they don't un even understand Nigerians under 25, under 30, or under 40, they make all sorts of um, flippant promises. Um, but it doesn't resonate with, with the younger generation, 35 and 40. When I was working in the, at, at the Senate, the not too young to run bill was passed. And everybody was jubilating. We thought, ah, this is great. Even young people, and they, they, to their credit, it's young people who really push this. Under the rather false assumption that once you lower the rate, the age for getting offices, um, you would uh, have a, uh, you will give young younger Nigerians greater opportunities to. Um, acquire political power to affect changes, and maybe reintegrate the young into the political process. I'll be honest with you, um, in, in private cycles, people like me raise serious concerns about it. Uh, it's not just about age. But anyway, uh, everybody supported it. And it was one of the fastest legislations that was passed. And there was good reason for it. Nobody in this country would tell you, no politician would say, yes, lower it. What is, what is the big issue? They want presidents, the age of the presidency to be lowered from, I think it was 45 or something? To 35. To 35. They want the age for the governor to be lowered. Big, no big problem. It was done. And do you know why it was so easy to do that? Because the politicians who did this, the National Assembly passed it like nothing. President Buhari assented to it like nothing. Everybody was jumping. 
It was that easy to do that because the politicians who, who passed it, not too young to run it, knew it was not about age. It's about huge amounts of money you require to buy power. And the young people don't have it. That was why it was so easy to pass it. So you get the credit because you, you appear to have opened the door for young people to come in. Mm. But what happened between that time, I think it was 2018 or 2019 when they're not too young to run there. Today, I don't think you have improved the access of younger people. I'm defining it from 35 below, uh, 35 even, or 40. I don't think you have more than 3% of the members of the National Assembly uh, with, within that bracket. Which means effectively that Nigeria has shut out its young, literally shut it out, and created the gulf between the young, 40 and below, and people who are 50, 60, and 70 and below. And we are not growing a middle class, political and economic middle class, because the economy is shrinking and collapsing. And as you know very well, the key to growth and development is the growth of the middle class. And that middle class, both in numerical terms and in demographic terms and in political terms, is central to any society that wants to retain a, a number of core values, that wants to maintain an economic process that develops and grows. And if that, the middle class is shrinking, it tells you you have a very serious problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. It means that, uh, like the book says, the center cannot hold. So th the ruling class becomes the elite. And it is not supposed to be that, because ruling doesn't make you an elite. And you have this rapid change. And the young keep growing. Their frustrations keep growing. Their anger keeps growing. They hear about a country. Nobody teaches them. And so they get the um, social media version of what Nigeria was. Then OK, we'll stop at this stage, because we'll take a short break. We'll be right back, uh, audience. Welcome back, uh, viewers. We've had uh, an excellent conversation on the meaning of generational fractures. And my sense is that the crux of the matter rests on the failure of socialization. Every society needs to train and pass its values to the next generation. And what's happening in this country today is that those values are not being transmitted to the next generation for, the, for various reasons. And that's why there is this break in communication. Uh, Hakim, what I'd want to ask you is the role of religion in all this. I've been following the religious scene for quite some time. You take Christianity, for example. The rise of Pentecostalism was very destabilizing for Orthodox churches. And what it created was deep divisions at the family level as younger members of the family became Pentecostal and therefore stopped listening to their elders, their parents, and other members of the same uh, family. And that's how that element of socialization became problematic. In Islam, what would you say explains some of this breakdown in the chain of socialization? Um, I think that you will have to go back to you know, Islam has been in crisis from, from 1900. 
a lot of people don't understand how much, how deeply colonialism affected Islam in Nigeria. Uh, in real time, what the colonization of Nigeria did was to create and impose a, a, a power over Muslim communities, impose its values, impose its systems, impose control over, over Muslims, the way they have lived 300, 500, 800 years from the coming of Islam to, to the north. So it was the most traumatic event. The British were able to assuage that, uh, that uh, otherwise drastic change in, in, in the power equation between Muslims and non-Muslims by um, uh, what was forced upon them to rule indirectly. But it was clear that from colonization to date, um, the Muslims in Nigeria have been governed by rules that are, are not non-Islamic. Uh, by cis political systems, to some extent economic systems that are not informed by Islamic principles. Um, in the 60s, uh, when the British were planning to withdraw in the 50s and the 60s, they, they had a very careful, uh, carefully designed system to be of uh, uh, inheritance. They cultivated an elite uh, very carefully that will take over from them, that will substantially live within the, the value system that, com that combined an indigenous African quasi-Islamic system with the, with the goals of a colonial power and an ex-colonial power. That didn't last very long. The, the succeeding class carefully used religion as a stabilizing force and as a, as, a lef, uh, as, as a basis for retaining power. Uh, there was no opposition, um, but it's, uh, it, it was almost an unfair fight because you, you were dealing with people who would dr uh, draw inspiration and power from Usman Afodio against uh, uh, people who championed the cause of the peasant. So it was a bit of an unfair, uh, unfair fight. They, Break, the real break that came from that was the emergence of Izala. Izala was a reformist movement which um, started uh, in the 70s. And it was the biggest rift uh, in the Muslim community in the North. You had a, a, a movement that sought to reduce the impurities in Islam uh, against a very conservative and dominant Muslim community. And it was, it was tr truly uh, um, uh, uh, a difficult time for, for northern Muslim establishment. Because you had Gumi, people like Gumi, and a lot of the ulama who decided to challenge orthodoxy that had been accepted for years and years and years. And so what it did was to now open the scope for debate, for challenging orthodox positions. For, um, and it created a lot of problems, the same as it did in, in, within the Christian community, for a lot of people to, to question what is right and what is wrong. You didn't have that before the emergence of uh, the Izala group. And it's still going on. Uh, but it, it, uh, it widened, uh, it opened up the divisions within the, the Islamic community. Now, the political context in which all this was going on was informed by two things. On the one hand, you had a system, again, let me say, was not indigenous to the North, neither to the Muslim Northerner or to the Christian Northerner. You had a system that um, was trying to find roots, the democratic process, that equated everybody and said it was going to be one man, one vote, and people can choose who, who leads them against systems that had, they were very powerful, that had a lot of power and influence. Uh, and so uh, the democratic, the products of the democratic process had all the powers. And your, the old systems, the emirs and the chiefs and the traditional values, 
um, we are losing ground gradually and gradually and gradually. And you, you now you, you have a situation where the political class that emerged through the democratic process as we speak now have near total control of political power and influence. Near total, virtually all of it. The tragedy about this is that in, in, in um, degrading the traditional institutions and values and creating new ones around just a small number of people, politicians, what you've done is to create a huge vacuum. And young people growing up who are seeing two different ways of doing things. Politics became the process by which anything goes. It's, it, it, it has a value system that justifies the end and the means as justifying the end. And, and if you go there, you, there are certain rules you have to follow. You have to have uh, like somebody like a godfather. It's about all about money. And it's about control of huge resources and power by a few people. But that is not the value system uh, in, in, in of the environment. The value system, the religion, uh, Islam and Christianity and the traditional systems that is that there's, there's the right way and the wrong way of doing things. There are value systems that are, cannot be violated by power uh, or wealth. There are, um, there are strong uh, negative ideas about corruption, uh, impunity, um, violence. But they don't get resonance, they don't find presence in the new political, in the system that produces leaders. And it's been going on up till now. So um, you have very strong values informed by faith, Islam. But Muslims are not allowed to live as Muslims entirely. They are governed by systems that are not most Islamic. Christians are informed substantially by divisions within the ranks of Christians, as well as this pool between living by strictly Christian values of decency and respect for uh, the word of God and being uh, uh, treating your uh, neighbor as you should uh, against a competitive system that just simply says, the world is out there, and it is for the person who gets there by any means. And that's, that's, that's where we are. You, you, you had a, a north. I, I suspect that in real terms, the way we lived in the 1950s is infinitely better than the way we live today. I, I, I think that in the, in the 1950s and 1940s, life had meaning. Values had meaning. People knew what was right and what was wrong. Um, now we are, we are getting to a point, tell your child today, Christian or Muslim, that um, it's good to be honest. It's not just good to be honest, it's the only way to be. And they will look at you as if you're, you are... You're from another world. Yeah, you're from another world. They will tell you, if, if you, there's no other way you can make it in this world if you're going to be honest. So simple values like there's a right way and the wrong way of doing things just sounds strange to our children because they've grown up in a system where religion doesn't influence what they do, whether they're Christians or Muslims. Traditional values don't, don't have. Parents have, have very little control in terms of the thinking of their parents. But more, more importantly, older generations have lost control of their younger. All the manifestations, all the the crimes you see in this country, most of the organized crime are stating only one thing, Jibo. The older Nigerians have lost control of their young. Otherwise, you and I know there is no way in the world that banditry and kidnapping will become such an industry in the space of five, seven, ten years. Fulani and the house of Fulani have lost control of those people in the bushes. You can't talk to them, you can't control them. And it's difficult to explain how this thing has become such a phenomenon without reference to the fact that you had a fundamental failure of the value system. If injustice, injustice may be one of the reasons why you had these crimes. The Igbo have lost control over their young. Who shuts down five states on Mondays? 
just a group of people who sit down and say nothing comes, up, nothing takes place on Monday? Nothing, absolutely. If you dare come out of your house, we will deal with you, kill you, injure you, well, molest you. Who does this? Every community in this country has lost control over its young. This is what this generation of Pakistanis is all about. You cannot control them because they don't feel they owe you anything. They have grown up in a country that has done nothing for them by their perception. That has actually taken away from them the future, hope, uh, some aspiration, a sense that of sense of being rewarded if they are good, if they do the right thing. So they, they have created their own world. They live in their own world and they feel comfortable in their own world because your world and my world doesn't give them anything. That is the biggest tragedy, and their numbers are increasing. We are producing children like it's, there is no uh, tomorrow. The, the, general, the, the population boom, these this young people being coming up is the most scary thing. By 2050, I don't know what this country would look like. And we are not paying attention to three things. Providing education to every young Nigerian, quality education, quality education, skills, and competency. You need to groom everybody from when they are 5 to 25. Well, let me just elaborate the question on education. Uh, uh, Facebook was reminding me of an article I uh, circulated three years ago where the DG of uh, NYC was complaining that many coppers are stuck illiterates, to use his word that some of them can't even write their names. But the issue for me is really what the late Ahmed Judah explained about what he called the promise of 1973, when Gowan asked all his ministers to give him one idea that will ensure that we'll never have another civil war in this country. And the response was quality primary education for every child born as of 1970. That's the end of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And that governments should undertake to keep that promise. Of course, when defining the fracture, you drew attention to the horizontal and the vertical level. At the horizontal, here in the Northeast and in the Northwest, we have extremely low levels of access to education mm. and of any type. Yeah. In the rest of the country, there's more access, but of course the quality of the education is going down. So how do you weave in this question of the collapse of quality education into these generational fractures? You have to understand it in the context of an elite that has betrayed uh, its people. An elite is, is relevant only to the degree that it leads somebody. It's an elite of some people. What the military did substantially, they removed the elite that they met in power, political and social and cultural elite. They represented the, the new elite. Um, but unfortunately, they were a transient elite. They didn't know anything about governance. They didn't know anything about sustaining values. They just governed and needed order and stability. And they, want, they did a few things while they were in power. When they were leaving, there was no opportunity for them to create an elite. They allowed the politicians to become the elite because there was no, no elite to become. This elite in the, in the, from the 70s that, that, that began to de become depleted, look, you have the compulsory free, and edu f compulsory free education, compulsory. Yeah. It means you universal. don't have a choice, universal education. It means you don't have a choice. You are a child, whether you are a Muslim from Borno or a Christian from Abia, your child must go to school. The corollary to that is that the state must provide teachers, the schools, the facilities, and everything, and the opportunity, including free education. That elite never informed. It's a law. It's an act which has been repeated over and over and over in different ways. 
how can you explain in the context of that that we have 15 million children out of school? How is it possible with the introduction of free, when we were going to school, you and I, you could count the number of non-government schools, primary and secondary schools, on your fingertips, and there will be mission schools. We didn't have private primary schools. You know that intrinsically there's nothing wrong with private education, but the moment private education was allowed to exist, the elite just simply then removed their children from government schools and sent them to private schools. And teachers employed by government with government money to teach children of the poor in government schools were now being employed or borrowed or paid by uh, proprietors, proprietors of private schools to go and teach children of the rich and the powerful, in the elite. And that's really where the collapse started. We had, we had, a, little, we had a layer that was eroded and, and there was, it ceased to think of the poor. And it's still the same thing. The most important thing is still what was in seventy is still. If you want stability to be, to, to be restored in this country, you must agree to fund education. Fund it realistically. If, you, if the government cannot pay this free tuition, free tuition thing that we're talking about, find another way in which children of the poor can find a way to get educated even if you have to give them loans. Because clearly, the idea that you can give every Nigerian child free education at, up to university, first is fiction, because even as we speak, it's, it's <laughs> they pay a lot of money for that. Yeah. And two, um, it, it, it's not sustainable. And there's nothing wrong in saying that. We need to come to terms with the fact that free university or tertiary education is not sustainable. Three, if, if, if the elite again needs to recommit. If you don't train the child of the poor to get good quality education, to get skills and competencies, you will never have a stable country because the huge numbers of the uneducated children who have no hope, no place in the society that is moving on with skills and competencies cannot fit. And these are the people who become robbers and kidnappers and bandits and, and uh, and, and other urban, urban villains. These are the people. And this, this phenomenon is going to continue to increase. So education in 73 was the most important advice they could have given the one, and it is still the most important one. And education, quality education, is the key to healing these generational fractures. Quality education, you must find a way. And to do that is not a, an easy thing. Look at where we are now. Five months, six months, our universities have been closed. You have an unthinking government that believes that this is, uh, this is the, uh, it didn't start with us and it will not finish with us. They don't want to, to, to accept accommodation, let them go. And uh, an incompetent as a leadership that thinks the only way is to continue to knock on the door, whether it opens or not, just keep knocking on the door. Lock out your children and the children of the poor. You need to break this circle. We can't continue to have us to strike over and o every year or every two years. Because it's the children of the poor that suffer. The children of the rich don't even study in this country. Or if they have to study in this country, they send their children to very expensive private school, universities. The child of the poor is out there. So once, if you don't address education from primary school to secondary school, if, and you need innovative policies, you m take the why, why won't you give the Almajiri food? You are giving children in primary schools one meal a day using public funds. Go to the Almajiri, go to the Malam, ask him to, to agree to, to keep the children in, in, in his, wherever it is that they do the Islamic thing. Give them one whole meal a day too, in place of this roaming around and, and begging on the street. And in those three hours, you would also teach them a few things that they can do. They are Nigerian. If you're worried about all these children roaming around, keep them in one place. But you have to use state resources to do that. So we need innovative and imaginative policies. We need people who genuinely care. This is the challenge of 2023. Hopefully, we will have a leadership that will have an excellent input into new policies or rejuvenated policies. But education is key. Now, the problem for education is that it has a long gestation period. 
politicians yeah. don't like it because they don't see the results immediately. 16 years to produce their graduates. Exactly. And you have only four years within which to produce results. Yeah. So what they do is that they pick a few schools, paint them over, put new chairs, and then they get president to say, ah, oh, he has built schools, he has renovated schools. But education is not about classrooms. It's not about chairs. It's about sustained funding, sustained a policy that says our priority more than anything else is education. Well, we have just one more minute. You appear to suggest 2023 may be a new opening, but uh, do you really believe that? Let me just say I hope so. <laughs> um, you pray so. I pray so. I <laughs> prayers are important. I pray so. Believe me for the sake of this country. I pray every day, and I hope that 2023 will mark the beginning of a process of turning this country around. You and I have benefited from a good country. We should be grateful. We benefited because people long before us had the foresight to provide for us. And we, we should be grateful for what we are. We, we lived in a good country. We should, we must work and pray that the politicians will, will, will recognize the fact that they have grandchildren growing up in this country. Those grandchildren are going to reap whatever it is that they do. And hopefully, they will, they will have a rethink. So we are true Nigerians. We end with prayer. And I think prayer works. We believe it works. And what's really important, given this excellent analysis you have offered, is that we must seek a way out of these generational fractures that's breaking up our society and creating massive insecurity for every member of the community. Thank you so much, Dr. Hakim Baba Ahmed, Thank you. for visiting Thank you. us. Thank you, Jim. Okay.